Okay, here we go. Good morning. Now, that song I just played for you is called The Drinking Song from the opera La Traviata. That opera was composed and played for the Italian public in 1853. And the composer's name is Giuseppe Ferdi. And if he were an American, his name would be Joe Green. This horn was made in 19... 19- 15. That's right. 1915. Still plays. I was born in 1936. So the only two things in this room that are older than me is the song I just played for you and the horn. Now, where the hell do you go on the internet or on TV and a guy is, comes on who's going to be the interviewer of a fantastic guest today and he comes out playing A song that's 166 years old, I guess. I'll tell you where you go. The Life After Scientology, and I'm Ron Miscavige, and welcome to this episode. Now, let me put my horn away. And we can get going here. Um, I guess the point I wanted to make about the song is, although it was written so long ago, it's still memorable. I mean, if you didn't know that that song was written then, you wouldn't think that's over 150 years old. So that was the uh, the real classy composers lived in, in those days. The, the Oh, well, even earlier times, like George Gershwin and Cole Porter. But over through the years, I think something happened where they're not writing songs the way they used to. Um, my opinion, of course. Anyway, let's get into the show. And to start off things with, I just want to introduce uh, a new Patreon, Wade Haynes. $2. Thank you very much, Wade. Very much appreciated. And then an old listener and an old subscriber, Kirsten, am I saying this right? Sundal, if, if I'm not saying it right, you can call in and tell Sean the right way to say it, or maybe send us a chat showing it, you know, how to p- pronounce it. Anyway, she went from $5 to $10, and I thank you very much. Your con- contributions are very much appreciated. And if you want to become a Patreon, just go to my website, the real Ron Miscavige.com, and you can do so there. You can go anywhere from two dollars to a hundred dollars, whatever you'd like, whatever you can afford. It will change you from being an observer or an audience into a participant because at that point you're doing something about it. The other thing is, I'd like to increase the number of sub- subscribers we have so we can get this site at least 10 times bigger than what it is right now. The more people we can enlighten on the abuses of the Church of Scientology the happier I'm going to be and the happier people out there will be if they can avoid getting involved. So now, without any further words, I'm going to try to hold myself back on this. I want to introduce my guest this morning. Very dear person. I know her a long time and she has a hell of a story to tell. Her and her husband are very successful now that they've left Scientology, both of them in their own professions. So without any further words, please welcome Claire Headley. Good morning, Claire. Good morning. Thanks so much for having me on your show. I really appreciate it. Well, I'm I'm very happy to have you on. And we, we went over this priorly before, you know, when I was booking her. And I, I said to her, you know, you've talked on Aftermath and several thing, places where you told part of your story. You probably told the whole thing. But when you're working on national TV, they have time constraints and they have to have other people b- appear on it. So unfortunately, you don't get a chance to tell your whole story. So this morning, uh, we're, we're going to listen to her story, which is it's a fabulous story because it has a great ending. But the things that happen along the way are not fabulous at all. They're, they're abusive, and they're an indication of the mindset of the people in the Church of Scientology. So 
let's get started. And I guess what I'd like to do is get started at the very beginning, because that starts when you were born. Uh, your mom, uh, you mentioned to me earlier that she was pregnant with you, what, 17 years old? You want to yeah. get into it right now? Let, let's roll. Sure. So, um, and, and yes, you're right, by the way, that, um, you know, the first 30 years of my life were in Scientology, and it was extremely abusive. On the other hand, it was the only life I knew, and uh, coming through all that and breaking free has certainly made me the person I am today. Um, so, you know, I, I think life is what you make of it. <laughs> I'll, I'll start on that note. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Um, I, I agree with you totally, because you could just sit around and say, oh, woe is me or do something about it. But listen, you did something about it, and that's to be admired, and that's really why I wanted to have you on, to yes. show people the, the power of an individual spirit, and an individual who is going to say, okay, I went through that. Hey, watch me. Watch me exercise my abilities and, and do wonders in life, and that's what you did. Okay, I'm going to shut yes. up. Go on. It's over and to you. you. Too. And you too, Ron. <laughs> it's <laughs> never too late to start life over again. <laughs> So I agree. All right, listen, I turned 83 in January, and uh, I tell you, I'm enjoying my life because I'm doing things I want to do. And the major thing I'm doing is this, is exposing yes. this and giving people a platform where they can come on and tell their story. Yes. Go on. Awesome. So, yeah, so starting at the beginning, um, my mom was um, born and raised in England, uh, Roman Catholic. Her, her brother got into Scientology when she was a teenager. She, she had gotten pregnant with me when she was 17 years old, and her brother got her into Scientology. She was into drugs, hippie, you know, you name it. And um, so Scientology caught her at a vulnerable moment in life or a vulnerable time and uh, hooked her in. Um, and so she read Dianetics when she was pregnant with me. Um, she and my father got, were married when she was eight months pregnant with me. Uh, they were both on staff at the Manchester Org um, in England. And um, so, yeah, I was born into Scientology. It was never my choice. It was the, the path that was handed to me by birth. <laughs> so... Yeah. Um, I would say when, when I was, uh, two or three, I'm not, you know, I've, I've never actually known my father, so I've never heard his, his side of the story, but I, I've learned it from family members who were involved, who knew what happened, but who were never in Scientology since leaving. But long story short, um, my father decided he wanted nothing more to do with Scientology. Uh, my mom divorced him. Uh, when I was three, and then right after my fourth birthday, she joined the Sea Organization. So at that point, um, essentially, that's, you know, my fourth birthday present was losing both of my parents to Scientology. One, because he left Scientology, and the other because she joined the Sea Organization. Wow. And so that was, that was the beginning. Yeah, it's a, a hell of a way to start it. So I guess you knew about the well, you maybe didn't think about it in those days, but you were the effect of disconnection at that very early age of three or four yes. years old. Yeah. Oh, yeah and, cool. and honestly, I, th I thought it was my fault. That's even, even at three, four years old, I can remember feeling that it was my fault. <laughs> I had done something wrong and that's what caused me to lose, you know, a parent. You know, I'm telling you that that's a point. I remember as a kid thinking the same thing about various things that happened, thinking, wow, I'm such a bad little kid. I, I don't know where the hell we get that from, but I, I know what you're talking about. Yeah. Yeah. As well, a little kid, you're thinking, boy, I did something bad. Now I made this happen. Isn't that wild? Yeah, and I, I think it's honestly human nature. You, you know, when something bad happens, you look at yourself. And I think Scientology preys on that as well, just in terms of the smoke and mirrors that, they erect around you that end up keeping you there far longer than, than you would think possible. I'll tell you, that is a very good point because mm -hmm. you're right. They do prey on that because all of their security checks 
are aimed at making you guilty. In other words, it's over to you. You did it. Something bad happens to you. What did you do to pull this in? Not trying to help you out in a, in a bad moment of your life. Well, okay, so now you're four years old. I think you mentioned earlier that that's when you uh, were put, were you put in the cadet org, org or did you join it? How does that go? Yes. So at that time, you know, so this was, um, 1979. Um, and so my, up until that point, we'd been living in Manchester. When my mother joined the sea organization, we packed up everything up, drove off in a car with the sea org recruiter and he took us to St. Hill. Um, where, where we were living was, uh, the Sea Org, um, birthing called Stonelands. Um, and so we were on arrival, we were put into this dungeon of a room down in the basement. I mean, it was just so nasty. Um, <laughs> it was, and honestly, it was like an old, you know, you, you can't get cl closer to the typical haunted mansion in England. If you tried, I, <laughs> listen, I've horrible. been to Stonelands. I know terrifying. what you're talking about. I, 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 it's a terrible place. It is like yeah. a haunted mansion. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. That's where I came to believe in ghosts. Was living there. I tell you. Wow. <laughs> well, you probably had some out there. Yeah. Anyhow, so so we moved there there and um my mom with the epf um i was immediately shuttled into i think the first few months i was just put in the nursery um and even then my first experiences there was this other little boy and he kept pinching me and shoving me and all this other stuff and i kept going to the only adult i mean it was one adult to probably i don't know 50 50 kids and realize a lot of those were newborn, like six weeks and up. Oh my six God. Six weeks old. <laughs> um, there was a room full of cribs and it was just always, you know, wow. screaming babies. It was just awful. Um, anyway, this little boy was pinching me and shoving me and I had bruises and I went to the, uh, the, the nanny and I said, you know, this kid will not leave me alone. He keeps pinching me. And she's like, well, what are you doing to pull it in? <laughs> like, what? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Anyway, that was the beginning of the end. You know, you very quickly learn, as you know, for me, even as a child, arriving into that, I go, you know, I'm screwed. I'm just. Now, that little, now, that little kid grew up to be a bully, right? <laughs> it's just, you know. Anyway, but yeah, so that was. Um, so a few months after that, I was moved to the cadet, cadet org um, and we were given uniforms and the way the cadet org worked, again, it was one, one adult, but other than that, it was like Lord of the Flies. The kids ran the organization, the, the CO cadets, the commanding officer of the cadet organization was a 14, 15 year old kid. Um, and so for me, from the age of six, I was responsible for seven other kids who were my age. We were in a team um, and we had checklists that we had to do every day. Our statistics were based on the checklist and the checklist was in lieu of parents. So, you know, hey, did you eat breakfast? Did you bake your bed? Did you brush your teeth? Did you take a bath? Did you do your homework? Uh, did you study Scientology, you know? Mm -hmm. All of that um, was included on the checklist. Um, did you do your, you know, we, we would do all the weeding, polishing all the floors at the birthing. Um, sometimes we would do reno renovations on the grounds. Um, yeah, it was, it was just, you know, fr from the age of five, if I saw my mother for two hours a week, that was a good week. Wow. Yeah. Well, it was a nightmare. And it's it's deemed by those in charge. Yeah. That that's I, what, I will, that, that's I will, where to bring the kid. Yeah, I'll give you two examples that to me um, kind of really il illustrate that life. 
Number one is that when I was, um, I think I was seven, and as you know, in the C organization, if you have sex out of wedlock, uh, that's considered an extreme crime, and you get sent to the RPF. Right. So my mother had a had a boyfriend who was also a Sea Org member, and they had sex. So she was sent to the RPF. Um, and so all of a sudden, now my mother, who's my only parent, is in the RPF, and I'm not allowed to talk to her. She she was you know moved off. I was just on my own. Wow. <laughs> And, um, you know, talk about, wow, what world do we live in? I mean, as a child, it's so traumatizing. It's just, uh, you know, it's oh. one example of how my life became a battle to try and get my, my mom back. Um, and so what ended up happening, she was on the RPF for, I, I believe, a two, three months. She was working on um, building the St. Hill Castle that is there today. Right. Um, one day she was on the construction site. They were chaining bricks back and forth and she got hit in the head with a brick and she had to be rushed to the hospital. Um, <clears throat> eventually she was, she was released from the hospital, brought back to Stonelands. And that was when I was trained <clears throat> on how to administer touch assists so that I could nurse my mother back to health. Jesus Christ. Yeah. <laughs> and, and so as bad as it sounds, I was just ultimately relieved to have my mother back. Oh, even, though, you were. even though she was hurt, even though I had to learn to do touch assists, I didn't care. I was just so thankful to have her back. Wow. That was one example. Um, a couple of years later, my mother had um, remarried to my stepfather, who's an American, and she had gotten pregnant. She was under a lot of pressure to actually divorce my stepfather. <clears throat> well, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Is she yeah. still in the Sea Org when this happened? Yes. Okay. Yeah. So she's still in the Sea Organization. She's married to my stepfather. She's pregnant. And, but meanwhile, she was under a lot of pressure to divorce my stepfather because he wasn't actually a Sea Org member. He, she'd right. gotten special authorization to marry him and then they revoked it. <laughs> so, wow. so she was pregnant and being pressured to divorce him. So she blew, she escaped and left me behind. <laughs> so again, I was on my own, you know, my stepdad went off to, help bring her back and um yeah it was could you just repeat that escape part because we had a technical dif difficulty here where your voice dropped out okay oh no no problem um so my my mom escaped right and so she blew and <coughs> left me she left me behind so again i was on my own um, I think it was four, four or five days before she was brought back. But um, to me, it just, again, uh, illustrates the, the tragedy of growing up in Scientology. Yeah, it is a tragedy. It is a terrible, yeah, I mean, it's a terrible story. I'm glad it has a happy ending because Christ, you know. Yeah. <laughs> I, I will say now, though, too, you know, growing up in it, I, that was just my life as I knew it. It's not that I'd, I knew any other story than my right. own. Right. And, you know, as, as I mentioned to you when we were talking, uh, when I had kids of my own, um, it really hit me like a ton of bricks. You know, when my son turned four, I was just like, oh, my God. That's how old I was when I lost my parents. And it really, you wow. know... It just it just hits you in the face like over my dead body would I put my child through anything like that and it really just gave me perspective of what that life was. Oh, I I can see that. And by the way, to you listeners out there, I've met all three of Mark and Claire's sons. They're good-looking kids, healthy, strong, 
they're smart and it just that's a product of very nice upbringing and you and mark have done a wonderful job on your kids i gotta tell you anyway i wanted to throw that two cents in so go on continue yeah, it's your, you. your time go on claire yes so um so my mom escaped and came back um left me behind anyway uh, you know i obviously we could talk about the different aspects of that but you know, oh, I'll give you one other example though. So I lived in a dorm with, with you know, 30 other girls. There was a, a boy's dorm and a girl's dorm. We didn't live with our parents at Stonelands. Right. Um, and so one day I, I was in the, sleeping in a bunk bed and I fell out of bed in the middle of the night, uh, landed on some wooden planks that had been left lying there. The the impact broke my collarbone and cut open my head. Whoa. Um, the next morning, oh, and so there was a security guard on, on a night watch, and he, I guess, heard me crying or something, I don't know, and he carried me up to m where my mom was living. Um, the next morning, though, I woke up. Obviously, my bone was completely broken. I was in excruciating pain. Mm. Despite all that, I adamantly insisted that I go to school because we, uh, you know, the cadets went to public school. So it was the only one piece of our lives that was somewhat normal. Wow. They somewhat because we were teased and called names and, you know, we, it was far from, it, it was, it was very well known that we were, you know, the orphans, so to speak. Um, but anyway, again, it was, it was the only piece of my life that I loved. So broken bone and cut open head and all that, I went to school anyway. Wow. Um, yeah. The, the teacher obviously saw, saw the wounds and at lunchtime I was called in to see the headmistress. It didn't strike me until 30 years later that the line of questioning was, they were trying to get me to admit that I'd been abused. Um, but you know what you, you know how it is in Scientology and as a child, it's even more so you are programmed to never say anything bad about Scientology under any circumstances ever. So, you know, I didn't say anything. I just said, Oh, I fell out of bed, you know, didn't yeah. say, Oh, I live in a dorm with 30 other girls and I never see my mother and there were wood planks and you know, <laughs> none of the that, that's abuse. That is abuse. It, you know, it's not a matter of somebody hitting you or something. To put a kid in that environment is fucking abuse. There's yeah. no ways about it. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, so, you know, I, I still never said anything bad. I was a, I was very well trained. And I also understood very well that if I did say anything bad, I would likely be booted out and lose my mom and be on the street yeah. or whatever. You oh, know. Yeah. yeah. And that's not unreal. They no. would have probably kicked you out at what seven years old and you'd been on your own with a broken collarbone and a busted head yeah that's why you do this program anyway yeah. go on clara because you, you now how long were you in the cadet org like how old were you when you got out i was 10. and what happened then what, what did you do then yeah so as i'd mentioned my mom had gotten pregnant um she she remarried and she was pregnant she was told that if she, if she decided to stay in the Sea Org, that that baby would be one of the last babies born into the Sea Org. As you know, the policy was implemented where um, you no kids were allowed anymore, right. um, and that's what ultimately led to women being forced to have abortions down the road. Um, but um, so, you know, my mom was. Um, pregnant. She, long story short, she decided to take a one-year leave of absence, have the baby. My stepfather had a lot of debt from having done his OT levels at St. Hill. Uh, I think he had thirty thousand dollars in debt, and they were both just getting Sea Org pay, so you know nothing. Yeah. Um, so the, they decided to leave. Um, I was immediately then approached several times um, by adults that I knew who were trying to get me to stay. So my, they, 
my mom would leave and they said, no, no, you're going to stay and you're going to be in the CMO as a messenger. Um, sign your contract. We'll, you know, we'll be your guardian. I was like, uh, no, thanks. Wow. <laughs> and they, they wanted you to sign a CR contract, in other words. Yeah, I mean, I had already signed a CR contract. I signed the my first CR contract when I was seven. Okay. Um, you know, they at at certain different points, every kid in the cadet organization was required to sign a, a contract. And if you refused, then you were in trouble, and you'd be put on manual labor, ethics handlings, you name wow. it. Um, because the idea of the cadet organization is you're being groomed to be a Sea Org member. That's, right. that's the ultimate goal of the cadet organization is you're in the Sea Org now. That's right. the graduation. I remember that. Yeah. There's no graduation from the cadet org into college or high school no. or, you know, a job in the real world. There's none of that. That would be a failure. Exactly. Yeah. Anyway, so um, so my mom routed out of the, or she took a one year leave of absence. We then moved to a house in East Grinstead. And at that point, um, you know, I honestly hoped that this would be my breaking away from Scientology. It just didn't end up being that way. Um, that, that was my hope, but it didn't happen. So. I started doing services at St. Hill and um, I did the student hat and you know, every, every, any break I had from school, I was there every Sunday I was there. Um, and other than that, I was going, I started going to Greenfields, which was the, which was a Scientology school in England. I, I do remember that. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, so that, that went on for two or three years. And then my family, my whole family, my mom had had my sister when I was 10. Um, then we, and she had an, another, another sibling, my younger brother. Um, and then at that point we all moved to the U S and we ended up in California. So you moved to the pack area. Is that where you were living? Uh, yep. In Burbank. Okay, yeah, but so did, you, did you do I, services there? What what happened there then? Yeah, so my stepdad became the ED of the Beverly Hills Mission, um, and at first I I continued doing services at Valley Org. I did my M one Method one work clearing co audit, OTRs, um, and then I went to I would then I was doing courses at Celebrity Center. Um, I did, and I did through academy level two. Um, and so also the other thing is um, when we moved to the US, my parents never put me back in school. Um, I was going to start at Delphi, but they couldn't actually afford it. So my mom ended up getting the curriculum from um, Mace Kingsley. Yeah. And I would just go to the library for two hours every day and I would homeschool myself. That was my education. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll tell you what, you turned out great because you're a successful <laughs> businesswoman. I mean, come on, maybe, maybe there's some value to it. You gotta, you gotta take some good out of a very bad situation, which I, sure. I consider that. You, you weren't in a great situation your whole life. And, you know, I guess I'm giving, I shouldn't give you my opinion, but I'm giving it though, Claire. And I'm so happy to see that you're doing well now though. Anyway, now you're you're 16 years old when you're out there. Is that how old you were? Uh, yes. Yeah, so this was so when we first moved. So I was 13 to 16. And keep in mind, the entire time from when my mom left the Sea Org at age 10, I was being hounded, hounded by Sea Org recruiters yeah. nonstop. At when I was 14, um, my my stepdad took me down to Flag for the Mission Holders Conference. And he introduced me to Peter Buttery, who was a class 12 auditor at FLAG, who was a good friend of my stepdad's. Right. And Peter Buttery um, was like, oh, you should, you should join right now where we'll train you to be a class 12 auditor and you'll be on the TTC. And 
you know, I thought, well, I'm not, I'm not in school. I'm not going to be going to college. I have no education. So maybe this is an opportunity. Um, <clears throat> anyway, also too, honestly, I, I could not, I couldn't, I, I had begged my, my parents to help me with the recruiters. And <clears throat> I said, can you please help? I don't want to join the Sea Org. And my stepdad looked at me and he said, well, you've done the ProTRs course. So that means that you should be able to handle any communication situation, no matter how difficult. <laughs> In other words, you're on your own. <laughs> again, again, you're on your own, right? Yeah, I was like, well, what's new? <laughs> okay. Yeah. Um, anyway, so I ended up signing, signing another CR contract at flag and I was supposed to start. So, you know, this was when I was 14. So I got back to LA and I couldn't do it. I caved. I was, I was crying. I, you know, I didn't want to leave my siblings. Um, and I was scared anyway. A, a week later, the recruiter calls me and says, Hey, you were supposed to start. At, by Thursday at 2 p.m. And I said, I know, I changed my mind. And she's like, oh, well, you're in treason. Lower conditions. <laughs> Jesus Christ. <laughs> it was a recurring story of my life. Wow. Anyway, so I didn't I didn't start then. I, I kept, kept going on the path I was doing. But finally, when I was 16, um, <clears throat> again, this time I was being recruited for the superpower to be a superpower auditor. Right. And um, <clears throat> uh, my stepdad was good friends with Richard Reese, who was the senior CS at Flag at the time. Richard Reese called up my stepdad and said, listen, if Claire doesn't start on her EPF by Thursday at 2 p.m., then I'm getting a committee of evidence. So <clears throat> my well, stepdad- wait, wait a minute, wait, before you go on. Yeah. How did he, How did he figure that he'd get comments because you don't join the Sea Org? I, I don't get this. What, what was the what was the connection there? So he he was the senior CS. He was responsible. He was running the mission that oh. was recruiting superpower auditors. I got it. Okay. Yeah. So you were going to be a recruit, which would be a statistic for him, and if his minion who we had out doing the work doing the street work failed to get you it was on him so he's going to get commented which by the way he may have made up that story you know that oh i know i know <laughs> i mean that, that should just have been bullshit okay i and know it was a way to get you out of the goodness of your heart to want to do it to save him from being commented but right. go on i know i i couldn't i couldn't deal with it the guilt was overwhelming at 16 i just thought god to me a committee of evidence was uh, you know i can't i hadn't been through one but i considered it almost equivalent to someone being declared suppressive it was in the same like bucket yeah. of horrible things that can happen to somebody and um so so i joined and um and I started before, you know, Thursday by 2 p.m. Went and routed in, and I so I did my EPF and pack. And um, I remember my mom dropping me off there, and I was crying, and um, <clears throat> I just felt, you know, path of least resistance. I I really had no alternative. Yeah, but I'll tell you those feelings that you have what I call gut feelings, whenever I get them, I have to go with them because whatever it is, it's telling me the right thing to do. And I remember I had, I had a hell of a time signing a Sierra contract and I couldn't figure out why, but I had a gut feeling this is the wrong thing to do. And I fucking did it anyway. And you know, to my regret, but here we are. So anyway, your mom dropped you off and continue the story, Claire. Yes. So, um, uh, you know, and, and also too, my, my mother, um, you know, she, I don't know, it was, she'd been in the C organization. So, um, she was actually devastated, um, that I, that I ended up starting when I came back from, you know, signing the paperwork and all that. I remember she was crying 
And part of that too was that I was looking after all my siblings more than she was. I, by that point, I was looking after them from noon until midnight each day. Wow. Um, and, you know, cooking, cleaning, keeping house, you know, the whole thing um, for which she paid me $20 a week. Um, anyway, it, I loved those kids like they were mine. But, and, yeah. and ironically, that was one of my biggest and honestly still is regrets um, because when I joined this organization, my sister was six, my brother was four, and by that point, my youngest sister was two. Um, anyway, so from there, uh, I did the EPF, um, graduated the EPF, and then I did the Key to Life course at the HGB. And um, by the time I, I finished Key to Life, um, I had been approved to go to the base. So in September 1991 is when I arrived at the Imp Base in Hemet. Uh, Claire, I'm going to back up just one second because yeah. uh, we haven't heard that term too much on this show, the key to life course. Could yeah. you, in maybe a paragraph or less, just give a short description of it and what it entails? Sure. So key to life course um, is a, a program, I would say, that uh, at a certain point, everybody was being put through that course, but it's Essentially, you do some clay table processing uh, where you're supposed to get into your own valence, your own identity. Um, you're supposed to shed any other identities that you've assumed as your own and get into your own beingness. Um, then you do, um, it, like, you word clear every single definition of every single small common word in the English language. So the a and and um and <clears throat> i mean that i'm sure you remember those books they were i do remember they must have weighed 50 pounds each <laughs> yes it is uh and, and you know any so you read the definition you're you're twinned up with another person read the definition you use it in sentences blah 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 um, and then let's see what was after that oh then grammar then you learn grammar Right. And and finally, at the end of that, you restudy the axioms of Scientology. So it's a, the, the concept is that unless you can communicate and truly understand the English language, you can't really understand what Hubbard wrote. Um, and so it's supposed to make you into like, you know, not super literate, but able to communicate and understand much better. Yeah. That's the claim. Yeah. Okay. I just wanted to give our, our listeners an idea of the course because truly I, I don't think anybody's ever given it a definition. Then I, I thought that was great. It's very understandable. It's very easy to, to get what you're saying. I, I appreciate yeah. that. Yeah. No problem. <clears throat> so, okay. So then we were at the point where you went to int or what, what, what happened now? You, you went to flag, right? Yes. No, I didn't, and I never made it to Flag. Okay. I was supposed to, I, I was supposed to go to Flag to become a superpower auditor, and the Key to Life was one of the the first course that I was doing at the HGB to become a superpower auditor. But <laughs> before I even got that far, I'd gotten there was a there was a mission at the HGB. It was Pat Bromley and Debbie Caval. And they were recruiting people to go to Int um, for Qual Gold. So Qual is the division in gold, staff training, staff auditing. Um, so they they started working on me. I so while I was doing the Key to Life course, I was put through security clearances for the Int base. <laughs> and funnily enough, the biggest hurdle I had to overcome to get approved to go to Int was that my mother had to sign over guardianship of me because I was 16. Right. And at first, she refused to do that. Now she denies having refused to do that. But I remember it very well because, you know, here was I. I was like, 
you know, you wouldn't protect me from, from being recruited. Now I'm in the C organization. Now I'm asking for one thing, which is please just sign over guardianship of me. Like what difference does it make? Really? You already did that when I was four. So come on. Yeah. And she refused. And the reason she stated she refused is because she had a friend that she worked with uh, whose daughter had been at the end base who the daughter left, had blown from the end base and the mom had to disconnect from her. And that was why she didn't want to, <laughs> she Jesus didn't Christ. want to allow me to go to int. Yeah. I, irony, right? <laughs> Look at us today. <laughs> a little, little late, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> That ship already sailed. Anyway, I, I was very upset. I was mad with her. And finally I said, look, you're going to do whatever you're going to do. Please just do this for me because I, you know, and, and part of it too was it had been represented to me as this amazing place. And I was like, Hey, if yeah. you're going to do something, then do it all the way and try and succeed at it at least. And that was how I was approaching being a Sea Org member. Yeah. I was try. I was just going to, do what was asked of me as you're trained to do, you know? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so finally one Saturday night, I was told, okay, you're approved. Um, you're gonna be going up to the imp base tomorrow morning, grab your stuff. Uh, and um, I'm sure you remember AK Urshkoff. Yeah, of course. Yep, she drove me up on Sunday morning and uh, so your mom had signed at that point. She had signed. Yep. Okay. <clears throat> so she signed over guardianship of me to Leonora Adam, this lady at, at Int. Oh, of course. That, I, remember, I remember her. Yeah. My mom had never met her. She was a very nice lady, but my mom signed over guardianship of, of me to somebody she'd never even met. Jesus Christ. Know. But why am I acting surprised? This is normal in this, in this New York, isn't it? Yep. It is. I mean, stuff like this goes on all the time. It There's does. a generality that's a specific. It goes on all the time. It does. Yep. Well, Leonora was not a bad choice. I, and I got to say that because I like her. Yes. She's, yeah. She was a very, very sweet person. Yeah. Not, Just, not a, not an evil hair on her body. <laughs> nope. No, she was not like a bitch or something. You know, you could enjoy your company and you're right. She was just a very gentle person too. Yeah. So now you 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 went to work in Qualden, right? Yes, and so I became a supervisor, a Kid Life, and LOC Life Orientation course, which was the follow up course to Key to Life. Um, so I was a supervisor there from September ninety one until March nineteen ninety six. Wow, you know, I want. Did you supervise me on those courses? Yeah. I did. I'll tell you, some of my life at the int base, I think I've blanked out because I know you from RTC, not from Qual Gold, all right? Yes. But whatever, I guess it must have been good, good supervision because I have no bad thoughts about it. I don't have any thoughts about it except one thing. The books were so heavy that they'd start coming apart at the binder because it was what's called perfect binding where it's not stitched. I think it's just glued in. And these books should come apart. You remember that? I do. Absolutely. And they were, and, you know, heavy. They were very heavy. Were so tired. Maybe it was that you were so tired also that you, you don't remember me as a supervisor. Uh, say that again. It could also have been that you were so tired. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's a point because tiredness was part of the Sea Org experience. Absolutely. You never, ever got enough sleep. Yep. Anyway. So now you're in Qual and uh, you're there until March of 96. Is that what you said? Yes. How did and you get so, to, go on? I'm sorry. Yeah, so, no, I was just going to say, so um, <laughs> we were talking earlier about committees of evidence. Yeah. So as a key to life LOC supervisor, I'm sure you remember the CINE staff. I think of the musicians as well for a while would only study on Saturdays, like all day Saturday. Right, well, that was because they were shooting from morning till night all week. That's right. So everybody else was doing renovations on the property on Saturdays. Um, right. Cine staff were studying all day. 
And um, in 1993, um, David Miscavige had ordered that everybody was to study the Wiz book, What is Scientology, when it had been redone. Right. And so um, it was an order. Everybody has to study this book. Well, when you're on Key to Life, you're not allowed to study any other materials. Right. And so this was this huge conflict. And so there was a staff member who was in review. He couldn't do, he couldn't keep studying the course because he was in review. So he was getting auditing to sort out why he was having such a hard time getting through the Key to Life course. And so he was just sitting waiting. So he, so unbeknownst to us, he was sitting there and he decided to read, to do the reading he was supposed to do of reading What is Scientology? Well, David Miscavige came in, found him sitting there reading the What is Scientology book, which was against the rules of, for what, you know, he was on the Key to Life course. And right. so David Miscavige said, if I find one more person reading this book when I'm going through this course room, then you're all getting commived. And so he walked to the back of the course room and there was another person doing the exact same thing and we were all commived. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Yeah. You know, Kamev, if you were to read how the procedures go, you would think that this is really a breakthrough in giving justice to a situation. But in real life, in application of it, if you're getting Kamev, you knew with 100% certainty you'd be found guilty. Yes. In all, you, in all the time knew. I was in the C organization, I never heard of one person getting comment that wasn't found guilty. Yes. And so, you know, it would, it would list all the charges, high crimes, misdemeanors, yeah. crimes. And you're right. Every single time it was guilty, guilty, guilty. You right. knew going into a committee of evidence. It was not, oh, this is um, an investigative body that's going to discover the facts. This was no guilty as charged. Yep, that's it. Yeah. yeah. So, okay, what happened with the comma then? <laughs> so I was assigned lower conditions and, uh, you know, I think 200 hours of amends that I had to do outside of my normal hours. So you're already, you're already working, you know, what, 12 to 16 hours a day yep. easily on a good day. And so now you have to do 200 hours of amends outside of that. Yeah. So the only way to get it done is to pull all nighters, which was yep. just, you know, par for the course. Yep. I, I, I know. I, I remember I did my first all nighter um, two months after arriving at the imp base when I was 16. Jesus Christ. <laughs> I don't even know how many. I can't I couldn't even tell you how many how many times I stayed up all night. I, I just, you know, the amount of times that I would have like nail marks dug into my palms like you know to stay awake yeah you know dig my nails in like i'd have like deep red marks in Gee. my hand just yeah. just to keep myself awake i do remember it yeah anyway um so yeah so that was i was a supervisor and you know um so then in march 96 i so i had gone through a whole nother round of security clearance to be approved to go to RTC. And um, I was supposed to become an RTC representative. And actually I was gonna be the RTC rep CC Int. That was supposed to be my destination when I was promoted to RTC. Right. Um, and so the day that I was approved, I was flown down the flag where the golden age of tech um, training, like preparation for the launch of Golden Age of Tech, which was going to be in May 1996. Yeah. Um, was in full blown, you know, there was hundreds of outer arc trainees there. That's where I met Aaron Smith Levin. Right. Um, because he was one of those trainees. Anyway, so I was down there with 20 other um, RTC rep trainees, and our job was to get all of those outer org trainees ready for the golden age of tech launch. Right. Um, 
And also, I will note that was, you know, March 96. Keep in mind, December 1995 was when the, the tragedy of Lisa McPherson's death had happened. Yeah, of course. As well, um, for which Ricky Jensen and Angie Trent had been the RTC reps at FLAG when that happened. Um, and the reason they were kicked out of RTC was because of their involvement in that. I see. Yeah. Anyway, um, so I ended up being at FLAG until January 1997. Uh, I was supposed to only be there a few weeks, but um, it ended up being much longer than that. Mark was meanwhile still at Gold. Mark and I got married in August 1992, by the way. Oh, what? Um, we forgot to bring that up. Yeah. <laughs> well, well, like, like these days, it's almost like you've been married to him forever, isn't it? Yeah. Yes. I mean, that's how I feel about Becky, my wife. I mean, we this summer we'll be married 29 years, and it's just like she's been part of my life forever. Anyway, go on. Yeah. yeah though, on that subject, I will note you and Becky are, and, and Mark and I, are one of the few couples that were able to emerge intact. Wow. You know, from Scientology. Yeah. You know, if you think about it, I don't yeah. know, you, know, you just go, it wasn't common for, you know, more often one, one of the, the husband or wife would end up escaping. Yeah. And then a divorce would ensue inevitably. Yep. You're right. Uh, that is very true. Yeah. So, uh, well, you had your strong will to, to your credit and uh, stubborn to a fault. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so now you get into RTC now, right? Yes. Um. Yeah. So. But well, okay, what what happened when you went back then? Because you you took on a higher position after that. Yeah. Well. Okay. So first of all, backing up a little bit. Um. In. So you know you know how it went in gold. Um, so now I'm just going to cover the aspect of the forced abortions briefly because that anyway you'll understand. Um, yeah. It's just it's just a part of it. As much as I wish it weren't, and as much as I wish I could turn back time always, but it anyway. Um, in gold, there were periods of sometimes up to a year where we didn't get paid. Yeah, I know. Yeah. So when you're not getting paid and yet you're required to pay for your own, um, uh, you know, contraception and, you know, whatever, um, birth control pills, you can't, you can't. Yeah. Um, anyway, so I, uh, I ended up in the situation where in 1994, so Mark and I got married in August, 1992. And then in, I think it was early in the year in 1994. So I was 19 and, um, and all of a sudden I'm like, oh my gosh, I, you know, I missed my period. I'm like, oh gosh, I'm, I of course knew having, I, I mean, I worked in Qual, I knew how many staff, how, how much of a common occurrence it was that a woman would discover she was pregnant and she would be forced to have an abortion. And right. when I say forced, it was just, that was the inevitable, there was no getting around it. No, there's no choice. You're, if no. you're pregnant, you're gonna have an abortion. I know that. Yeah, yeah. And, yeah. and in fact, I've gone through my, you know, I have very good memory. You know, I remember names and faces and in our lawsuit, I went through and made a list of all the women I absolutely knew had had an abortion and it was more than 50. Keep in mind, this was not, uh, oh, I think that person had one. This was people I actually knew. Yeah. Um, and, you know, of course we talked about this on Aftermath, but, but for me, it was devastating. It was just, you know, my worst nightmare come true. I never told my mother about it because I couldn't. Yeah. Um, you know, I'd always wanted kids. I loved kids. I, you know, I was so terrified. Um, but that was the position I found myself in and, and I had to pay for it on $40, you know, no pay, yeah. not even $40. Um, so I ended up having to borrow money from Katie Feshback 
to pay for it. Um, and it was awful. And I, I promised myself at that moment. Like, so, you know, the way that that happened is I was driven there by Mark Treasure. Um, right. He was in Qual. And beforehand, I was prepped by the medical officers. She said, okay, I'm going to take you to the Planned Parenthood Center. They're going to ask you uh, if you want to consider your choices. You say no. They're going to ask you if you want to talk to a psychologist. You say no. Um, they're going to ask you if you want general anesthesia. You say no. Um, and you just go go and do it. I mean, it was... <laughs> It was so barbaric. What that, they, that is that, that is that is barbaric. Yeah. No, I, I didn't know that that was a, the exact procedure. You just inf informed me of that right now. Yeah. That you were had it not to take any advice from a psych or, and not not any anesthesia. Were you given a local anesthesia? How did it go? Um, there there was like uh yes, there was a minor local anesthesia, but it. I mean, it was, it was, it was brutal. Yeah. And you're aware of the whole thing. It was awful. It was anyway, yeah. I'm not going to. No, it's awful. And it goes on and they denied that it went on. That's. Yeah. And you know, the, the biggest thing that, that struck me too, when I was there is the the people at Planned Parenthood were very kind. Um, I just couldn't, I, I had built up so many walls by that point to not, communicate anything but what almost broke me was the lady said she looked to me and she said is your husband with you I wow. said, no no you know and like anyway that's that's something because in a normal sane environment well of course of all you you wouldn't have an abortion but no. certainly your husband would go with you yeah. And I, I know this, there was no fucking way he could get off for you, with you to take you to an abortion. I do know that. Yeah. And even even the humiliation of having to write a CSW, like, oh, I need to go see a doctor. I, oh, my God. Just on and on and on. Like, oh, uh, well, are you doing lower conditions for this? Because this is this is not except, I mean, it just every, yeah. you know, I had to, anyway, you, you know how it goes. But I know exactly. the, point, the point being that at that point, I I was like, "This is I'm never doing this again, yeah. ever. I'm not doing this again." Well, cut to now. I'm in Clearwater, Florida, and Mark is in California, and I'm now in RTC. And within the first few weeks of me arriving there, um, David Miscavige was. We were in a meeting with him for like eight hours. We were standing in the What's that? No, I had to get um, my producer. I had to get him in a different position so I could see the monitor. That's all. <laughs> Go on. No worries. So on arrival in Clearwater, within the first few weeks, um, there was some big flap. And David Miscavige was absolutely livid about um, uh, security, security breach that had happened. Anyway, he was yelling and screaming, coming in and out of the... Um, conference room and we were all standing there you know it was, yeah. it was in march standing on our feet for hours well somewhere in the middle of that i passed out just like plunk fell down and i got carried out of there taken to to sit down and next thing i know out of nowhere they bring me a pregnancy test to do i didn't i had no idea honestly i i still to this day i don't know what happened Either way, I did the test and it was positive. And now I'm in the same boat, but this time where I had decided that no matter what happened, I would not go through with it. Now I can't even tell Mark. So, you know, I, in my mind, I'm going through, I'm like, if I, if I try and fight this, and if I do what I had planned to do, I'm never gonna see Mark again. And I, in my mind, knew they would never even tell him. Mm. And so I tried to get approval to call him. Uh, you know, not because of that, but like trying to talk with him. And that was disapproved. Ann Rathbun said, nope, no can do. Anyway, 
um, yeah, that, so I ended up having to do, go through with that a second time, despite wow. the horror and the, the fact that I had, and I couldn't even, I didn't get to tell Mark until six months later. Jesus Christ. All right. Look, that's behind you now, but let's continue on with the story. Okay. Yes. So Ron, I'm sorry. I just realized what time it is. What should we do in terms of time? Well, we can do another show, we can do another show if I can get you back. Sure. Let's do that. Cause yeah, I, I, I'd, I, I'd love that. And, okay. uh, cause there's, there's some real good stuff to come up and I, I don't want our listeners to be without that information. <laughs> um, Christ, it's so interesting. I, I personally lost track of the time. I got to take. <laughs> I did too. And, and except I just realized, you know, I, I told you, I kind of scheduled things tightly. And so my friend is coming to pick me up to go to a event thing in about five minutes. Okay. Well, look at uh, uh, Sean, do you have something to say? Yeah. We got a couple of super chats to get to, but yeah. if Claire wants to go, it's totally fine. We can just, well, no, look, could you stand for another three or four minutes? Claire? Yep. Yep. Okay, go on. Okay, so uh, Peace Love Salmon for $5 says, I appreciate everything you are doing. Keep fighting the good fight. Sending love and strength your way. Oh, well, that, that's wonderful. And I appreciate that comment. And Claire, that was uh, over to you. You're fighting a good fight, too. You're Absolutely. part of this. I mean, Christ, yeah. you're coming out and talking about these things. This is this is wonderful of you. And tell them very, thank you very much. Uh, and Albert Silva for two dollars says, "Love you, man. Keep it up." Albert, uh, go on. Albert Silva, yeah. Albert Silva, thank you very much for the the nice comments. I appreciate it, as I'm sure Claire does too. So. Yeah. Melissa Payne for four dollars says, "Amazing guys, Ron, you look as handsome as ever." I, <laughs> I told her that. Would what the hell am I going to do about it? She <laughs> says, "I look as handsome as ever." <laughs> you know, I'm going to tell you something. My agent said to me, "You know, Ron, you're conceited." And I says, oh, come on. I mean, although I have every right to be, you know, yeah. <laughs> that's an old Hollywood joke. But anyway, th thank yeah. you for the kind words and yeah. uh, uh, thank keep, you for listening. Yeah. Karen Cookson for $20 says, keep the light shining on this cult and the damage it does. And she also became a $20 patron, which we'll mention on next week's show. But Wow. Hey, let me tell you something. I'll, I'll continue to do this. You can count on that. And I appreciate your support. No matter what. This shit is going to be exposed. Yeah. And I hope we can get 10 times the number of people to watch this because the more people that are enlightened, good things yeah. happen when you have a little, a, a whole bunch of people thinking the same thing. All and right. There, and there is one question for you guys, uh, $5 FYT. He asks, question for Ron and Claire, do you ever make contact with current Scientologists? Claire? Um. Yes. I would say, um, I mean, we've had people call us who were actively on course and coming home saying, oh, we, you know, trying to get out. Um, but, and, and also there's people I would say that I, that we've kept in touch with who are under the radar or, you know, who would leave, but for um, sake of maintaining family relations, they're, they're just laying low, so to speak, but yes. Yeah. Well, okay, with me, I I would say no to this, except I had a, an opportunity to call one gentleman last night who is under the radar, and uh, so I have a contact with one. Anyway, Claire, I appreciate your time very much. You too. And all of you listening there, uh, subscribe so you'll know when she's going to be on again, and uh, let's. I, I look forward to having you on and, and doing this again, Claire. Okay. Thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate it. Yeah, and I appreciate you coming on. And those of you out there, if you want to help in this endeavor, you can become a Patreon. Just go to my website, therealronmiscavage.com. The other thing you can do is get more subscribers so we can build up our audience more. And the other thing is tell people about the abuses of the Church of Scientology. Oh, you can buy my book, too, because this is a great book. Uh, by my own admission, it's a great book. <laughs> <laughs> it's a chronological story of how this entire thing, starting from when I was born to when David was born, right up to the time in, when the book came out in 2016. Anyway, I'm Ron Miscavige. This is Life After Scientology. See you on the next episode. Bye-bye now.